All right, so the tech person just told me I got to do that again, so here we go. Welcome to the end, I thought, ladies, as well as other local talents, book reading. I wish you guys were here in person. I feel sad that you're not, but that's okay. We'll work with what we got. Yes. And I'm Wilnona. And I'm Jay, and we're missing one person, so hold on, she's coming. Yes, of course. Okay, I'm coming. And we have with us the end of it. W.A. Annapolis President, Ms. Jenny Yakovici. Hello. Yes. And she actually made it, y'all. And it was really awesome of her <laughs> to like brave this winter weather that we're having, or actually having snow, which you know doesn't happen very often here. So if you're in like London or LA, if you're in London, how? Yes, we have worse weather than you this time. And if you're in LA, <laughs> can you please switch. Please. <laughs> but anyway. I'm going to tell you what, uh, we were going to start off with Scarlet Black explaining like what we do and then why we kind of sort of came together. First of all, to celebrate the talent that we have in Maryland and the raging counties, as well as it, Kamichi. Kamichi, are you here? Okay, not She's yet. not here yet. She's not here yet, so okay. And Virginia, when she arrives, we'll actually have Virginia as well. Anyway. Uh, we were going to start off with Scarlett Black, and I was going to introduce her instead of doing her entire speech, which would have been nice. Scarlett? Okay, no. I'm doing the speech. Scarlett Black runs the Survivors of Domestic Abuse Program, and one of the reasons that we came together is just to let more awareness be known about that program as well. She started out in 1989 helping people, women, escape using her own money and her own Resources. resources to assist with uh, their escaping from domestic abuse or partners of that had domestic abuse, escaping from them as well as with the children and helping with the child care and everything like that. I'm rambling now because I have to read this up on the fly. <laughs> and also, we came together because we do have a couple of very strong poems in our books about um, emotional abuse and how most people really don't think that's a thing. They just think you need to be a little more strong minded than you are and don't and not let someone change who you are, which kind of isn't true. Because if that was just the case, then people wouldn't let it happen to them to begin with. So we really came together on that point and she was a really awesome person and she's been taking care of people and helping people escape for so many years. And we celebrate her work that she has done and we try to support her all that we can. That being said, she was also a survivor of a domestic abuse uh, relationship. So I, that's kind of what she started. I always think that's great. She took a weakness and turned it into a strength. But enough of me rambling about goodwill and warm wishes for everyone. <laughs> Yay. We're going to have our first reader, if that's okay. Or do we want to do introductions first? We should introduce our panel first. <laughs> so I'm Jay. You guys probably know that. Nona, Jenny, and right over there, Kemi. Kemi, yes. I was going to try to get your handle, but never mind for other people who are on Zoom and looking at this. But then we also have Kemi with us virtually. Yay! Good. We're going to start with our first reading, which is going to be Kemi. Awesome. If you wouldn't mind. Do you have, are you prepared? For yes, I for I'm prepared. supposed to be the third, I know. But of the three, the first one here. The first one. I'm here. Um, which of the books do you want me to read? Well, whichever selection you have chosen would be fine. Okay. If you need a moment, we can start with Jenny. Okay, that'll be great. Miss Yakovici, I should call you that instead of Jenny. I am so sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> I hope people don't call me Jenny. Um, I thought that I would read from, uh, we talked about which one I should read from, and I thought on this cold, snowy winter day that maybe what I would do is read something about a hot summer in Washington, D.C., you know, sort of get us all in a different mindset. So I'm reading from uh, my debut novel called Up the Hill to Home. It's about four generations of a family in Washington, D.C., between the Civil War and the Great Depression. Uh, and this is taking place in a uh, three-generation family 
uh, 13 people in one house with one bathroom. Try to imagine that one. Uh, and what we have are uh, Ferd and Lily Boyd. They live with uh, Lily's parents, Charlie and Emma Beck, and uh, also their nine children. And so we're discussing uh, we're discussing the joys of living through a Washington winter. In um, this is about 1932, so uh, no air conditioning. And so if you've ever lived through a Washington winter or Washington summer, you know how painful that would be. So here we are. This chapter is called Near Misses. A Washington summer is a physical being, a shaggy, slobbering beast, relentless, inescapable, forever panting its heavy, humid breath into the face of each citizen and pushing its weight against the wilting populace, demanding attention, a constant, unwelcome companion. Inexplicably, the nation's capital is built on a swamp. George Washington chose it because he wanted the capital built from the ground up, a new shining city to represent a new shining nation, instead of repurposing an existing city like Philadelphia, which would have come with its own history and significant baggage. To Washington's thinking, the area is perfect, a blank slate, virtually untouched by development. Little wonder, since most people have had the good sense to stay away. Granted, the choice of a southern city is the quid for the votes Hamilton needs to fund the new country's debt, but still, a man who spends his early years as a land surveyor might know better. The swamp is drained bit by bit, often poorly, as the city pushes past its boundaries and more land is needed. Entire bodies of tidal water are rerouted and contained in concrete culverts. Tiber Creek forced out of existence by engineers who bury it under internal revenue. The city's malarial climate proves unconquerable, however, prompting Teddy Roosevelt, famously and unfavorably, to compare DC to equatorial Africa. Though a Washington spring can sometimes be ephemerally sublime, each summer oozes in on a glistening slime trail to suck initiative and industry from the inhabitants like a vast enveloping leech. In an especially cruel summer, sleep might be traded as a commodity on the exchange floor to make a killing for the man who divines how to package and sell it. The closest anyone comes is in the invention of the electric fan. Electric being dear, most homes have only one, trained jealously each night onto the family's breadwinner. There in its flow of heavy, damp air, he might find fitful sleep and be able to slog, hollow-eyed and drained, but still functional, back to work the next day. As a dual earner household, the Beck boys own two fans. This affords Emma and Lily a bit of relief since each enjoy some spillover of air movement in bed at night, but it helps the kids not a whit. Inevitably then, some variation of the same conversation conducts itself multiple times each summer as though from a script passed child to child over the course of years. Child number one, how come daddy and Granner get the fans? Lily cleaning up from dinner because they have to go to work in the morning so they need a good night's sleep. Child number two, why can't we have a fan too? Lily, you don't need a fan. Child one flopping an emphasis, but it's so hot, we're going to die. Lily, you're not going to die. Charlie looking from behind his newspaper. Back before the electric, it was a common thing for little children just to burst into flames walking down the street. Child number three, always the youngest. Really? Lily, dad, you're not helping. Charlie, no, it's true. People had to carry around buckets of water with them just in case. Skeptical silence. Child number two, but why can't we, Ferd, passing through from the parlor, stop pestering your mother? But not another word. Silent assessment of available gambits. Emma, not even looking up from the mending. You know, when I was your age, collective groans, a slouching away in defeat. Charlie, going back behind his newspaper, works every time. <laughs> Thank you. I think we all remember that when yes. I was your age. I'm like, oh, no. not, not again, but not another when I was your age. That's right. Always. 
I had to wear, walk uh, uphill through the snow both ways, five miles. <laughs> <laughs> always happens that way. And then you, that's always a collective groan. And then it was like, can we do anything about it? Anything. <laughs> completely forget about the hand. By the way, that's my favorite accent. Yes. <laughs> Every time she reads it. That I, that's the one that I go to because people in Washington understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Washington summer and to think about not mm -hmm. having anything like any way of cooling themselves. Yes. And, and again, in this book, um, uh, electric had only been added to the house about 10 years after it had been built or even longer than that. Uh, so they had started out with no electricity at all. And uh, they had gas, so they had gas lighting um, after it had been built. But for many years, it had no electric of any kind. So just that concept of trying to stay cool in the, the basically the equatorial heat and humidity. It's always the humidity in Washington, D.C., isn't it? It's always <laughs> That's the always the It's not the heat, it's the humidity. It's all of it, okay? It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. <yeah, laughs> it is, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And I remember my friend from Colorado when she moved here. The first thing she said that she was like, "Do you guys, are you guys aware that you just drink yeah. air? You, yes. you like, it is wearable air. Yeah, right? exactly. It's like a blanket. Yeah. Yeah, she's like, in the summertime, it feels like you just put it on. Like, yeah, exactly. And then exactly. I had another friend that came from California. And she said, "I'm used to it being hot. I live in the desert in California. She said, I'm used to it being hot, but it just seems like you guys put on an extra coat. I mean, how do you breathe very shallowly?" <laughs> that take shallow breaths. <laughs> but I'm not gonna lie, it's better than Florida. I remember yes. when I got off the plane in Florida and I was like, I wanna go back to the recycle air. Yes. <laughs> Can you put me yes. back on the plane? Anything that where you want to recycle air, it's definitely worse. But okay, I apologize, you guys. We got a little off topic, just a tip. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions in our virtual audience for Ms. Am I saying that right? You absolutely are. Yay! Good Italian, <laughs> Italian name. So. I'm sorry, you missed your question. What was it? I'm sorry, was there a question? Did I miss it? Or was it just a laugh? Because if it was, yes, I am humorous. Oh, the conceit <laughs> never ends. It never ends. It just never keeps ends. going. Or you guys can type it in the comment um, chat section, and hopefully I'll uh, take that and pick it up. And when she keeps it, will tell us the question and we will proceed on. And there is nothing. There is never, I, I, under, I never understand this virtual audience. I love you guys immensely. But why? Why never any question? I'm finished whining. So did you want to tell us how you came to write this book? Sure, absolutely. Oh, you know what? You never have to ask me whether I want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Will Nona and I are good in that way. Um, so I came to write this book, um, one, because uh, I'm an English major from way back at the University of Maryland. And I think that, uh, as we talked about before, that there's sort of some law in the books that you are, are legally bound to write a novel at some point. You and you're an English lit major. Um, so I've always considered myself a writer, but without um, having used a whole lot until I was a certain age. The three, the thing that really prompted me to finally write this book that I had actually thought about writing for probably 30 years was that uh, I was at a point in my career where I had achieved a pretty good measure of success, uh, well established, and um, but it really wasn't satisfying my uh, uh, the thing to bring me joy. It was interesting, it was rewarding in a number of different ways, but it wasn't creatively uh, enthralling. And it didn't, um, I, I found that I really needed something uh, to find the joy, something that, that deserved my um, interest, my, my passion, my creativity. And so I finally undertook to write this book. And, um, and, and I think that that's one of the things that I, I try to tell people is that, um, yes, you need to make a good living. You need to make sure that you're capable of taking care of yourself and, and your family, your loved ones. Uh, but really, um, we miss so much when we get caught up in the day to day everything and don't remember that there are the 
that there are those places in ourselves that we really do need to um, to foster, and and it is um, about making the most of what you can contribute and what you have to say and, and how you can interact with uh, those around you. And um, sort of back to what you were talking about with Scarlett, one of the things that I also find is, and I think you all uh, know this too, is that that writing is a wonderful way to um, find your way through difficult things that you're trying to understand for yourself and where there is some healing that needs to occur and where you're trying to make sense of, of things that have happened to you. And I think a lot of people, uh, uh, survivors of different kinds of trauma, uh, find that writing is a wonderful way of, of healing. Things. For me, I didn't have a traumatic experience, but I, but I felt uh, strongly that I, uh, I had a story that I wanted to tell. I thought it was an, an interesting story and one that would speak to people. Um, and as I said, it was it was for me, and actually it was also for my mother because it's my mother's family. It's her it's her story. She is a character in it in that novel, and uh, which just tickles her to no end. She's she's six now, going on eighty seven, and she just thinks it's the most wonderful thing in the whole world that she's a character in the story. <laughs> so. Anyway, um, so for me, it was that it was that finally doing that thing that was calling to me. That was a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> I have to say, I love authors for that. Yeah. You, you ask a question, you sit back, and you just listen. let it go. <laughs> let it go. Oh, I understand. I get it now. It's just perfect. It's perfect. It's, you guys, I, I have to say, because I think it's because you're wordsmith. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say your. I'm a you wordsmith as well. Exactly. I just don't like to use all my words. <laughs> <laughs> I use lots of them. I use lots of words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is weird, like having a person like you and I'm the same bro. I'm like, you like going, oh. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I we have some, we have some fun. Like, Yay, people. Through the snow. <laughs> Oh my goodness, y'all! Virginia is in the house. What? Can you oh, I'm so sorry. So I'm going to um scoot over so you can see the lovely Gabichi Jackson and now have her on the screen. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm like um. I'm a, I'm a co-host, so it's it's not like it's a problem. <laughs> I will happily get up. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you, Miss Jackson. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. This is your screen time. <laughs> I have plenty of screen time. I have, I'm creating my own TV channel, so I can have <laughs> screen time. Oh my goodness, Kami, are are you close to ready? Me. Oh. Not Kamichi. Kimi? Kimi? Kimi, yes. I'm ready. Okay. Yay. I did not recognize you. No one told me that this was a whole body thing. I thought it was just my head. So I'm sitting here looking at my phone going, I'm checking on people's progress. This is not working for me. All right, Kimi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Great now. So I'm going to pop off and I'm going to let you introduce yourself fully. And, um, Oh, if you don't mind, can I ask Ms. Jacobici one more question? Do you mind? Go ahead. Okay. I forgot to ask you, like, normally people introduce themselves and they talk about, like, everything they do. Right. <laughs> okay, until she came on our show, I was just like, oh, she's an awesome author. Yay, wonderful. We'll have her on. <laughs> and then she started going down the list of what she does. And I'm like, oh, my. What are they if I had known that, I would have prepared better, at least for another two hours. So would you like to tell us what you do? Uh, sure. So besides having an actual full-time job as a system engineer, which is a, a really boring thing to talk about in, uh, with people who are creative types. Um, technology? I, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you want to swap places? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do the IT. As a matter of fact, I always need an IT department. Um, 
So I am the president of the Annapolis chapter of the Maryland Writers Association, which for anybody who's in the area, who's in Maryland, I highly recommend if you are an author or you're attempting to be an author, uh, we would love to have you participate. It's a wonderfully collaborative, collegial environment uh, uh, organization who is very supportive of its members. Um, I am also a reviewer and an assignments editor for the Washington Independent Review of Books, which is an online uh, daily publication. Um, we sort of came into being when the uh, Washington Post stopped publishing, unfortunately, its book world as a separate Sunday supplement, and that was sort of the beginning of the end of, you know, books uh, in, uh, in daily newspapers. Um, but so we are an online review site and we publish new content five days a week and uh, uh, we are now being um, archived in the uh, in the Library of Congress so apparently we've we've uh, made it into the big leagues yes. uh, um, okay also, thanks <laughs> say that again oh, we didn't quite hear you <laughs> I missed it uh, and then uh, I also belong to um, Pen America, which is all about protecting freedom of speech. And interestingly, up until recently, um, Pen America was primarily focused on freedom of speech in other countries that where it seemed like it was at risk. Um, but now it focuses a lot of its attention on the United States. So interesting shift in attention. And lastly, I'm also a member of um, the National Book Critics Circle, which is all about um, continuing to pursue the, the art of uh, critical thought, which sometimes comes under fire uh, for being considered, um, I'm not sure what, mean maybe, or something. Uh, whereas critical thought is basically finding out whether an idea hangs together or not. Uh, so, um, so one of the things that we talked about when uh, I was on your show was that I was um, um, helping to judge their uh, Leonard Prize, which will be given out in March, and it's uh, their annual award for the best um, debut author. And so I had finished all reading all six of them, and they were all wonderful. So the debut authors that we have coming out are. Um, to me, they are amazing in how, um, how often they come out completely, fully formed and very, very assured of their voice. Um, so it's wonderful to read uh, debut authors and see what they, the diversity of ideas and of voices. Um, uh, I think we see that um, in debut authors now more than ever. So wonderful. Anyway, that was probably a little bit more than you wanted, but uh, those are some of the one of some of the things that I participated in. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. When she started going down the list, I was like, "Oh, so what do you do?" And then she went down the list, and I was like, "I just thought she was the president of the Annapolis chapter." <laughs> Oops! It <laughs> had a very great book that we could all understand yes, about I mean, how we don't want our parents to hear our parents' stories. Of, that was good. <laughs> I walked up here both ways. I had to take my books back together because I was trying to graduate high school. We all didn't want to hear all those things. <laughs> so it was like really crazy. So between that and I'd say I got real nervous after you said it. Like I was so happy it was like a headshot. Like, if you ever watch our show, it was only like up here. So I'm sitting there like, Jade, what do I do? I to keep smiling and be like, oh, that's so interesting. Wow. Otherwise, this is the, the, the smile and oh, good gracious, I'm in trouble. But anyway, thank you so much thank for you coming. Very much. It was just awesome to have you. Okay, now officially this time, Kimmy, when I give it to you, I am not taking it back at all. We promise. We promise. That's fine. That's fine. So, you want me to go ahead and introduce myself? Yes, yes. please go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kemi Shigoe. I'm a certified professional coach, a multi award winning author, and an international speaker on life and relationship issues. My main purpose in life and mission is to support singles um, to find who they are, experience love prior to being in a relationship or while in a relationship, and also to build on healthier relationships after that. 
to make their lives become better, not bitter. I am the author of three books, um, Love, Sex, Lies, and Reality, which I'll be reading from, In Single, A State for the Fragile Heart, and Beyond the Pain, A Return to Love. Um, I'm also a full-time IT consultant, and I am also a mom of a teenage son, who is my life and my miracle. Uh, <laughs> So let me get started. Today I'm reading from Love, Sex, Lies, and Reality, and I'm reading from um, the Nugget 5. I write in nuggets. I don't write in chapters because sometimes chapters are voluminous and people don't remember what they read. So I write in nuggets so that you can get the nuggets and you can get the challenges after the, each nugget and you can learn from that. So um, Nugget 5 talks about facing reality after experiencing breakup or divorce and knowing what you need to set so that going forward you don't get hurt any longer or you don't repeat cycles. Um, it says facing reality. It may be tough to admit to reality when one is busy living a lie, but the moment you embrace it and seek the truth, the quicker you face it, the faster you get to heal and learn to keep it real always. Pain, fear, anger, bitterness, or resentment can cause one to live a lie. Hiding behind ego is another factor for living in falsehood. It is very much okay to address issues of the past and face reality so, that, so as to live up to one's expectations. Addressing the fear of being alone. A relationship ending may seem to be the finale of togetherness and what seems to be like living, being alone all over again. However, you need to realize being alone sometimes has its advantages. Time spent alone allows you to think about what you really need and deserve for a lifetime. It also helps you heal from the pain, reflect on the past, digest, digest the lessons learned, and rejuvenate. Relationships can be draining, and time alone allows you to take the stand about what you really need, but where you really need to be with yourself for the moment. It may seem scary when you are used to having someone around you, holding you and always being there for you when you have been through. But as the old saying goes, 20 children cannot play for 20 years. You have to come to a place where you face your fears and become comfortable with yourself. I always suggest taking time to be alone away from friends and family so you can purge your thoughts and process new ones clearly. No, do not allow loneliness to push you to the point where you opt for a rebound relationship or ones that leads you to nowhere, such as friends with benefits. These relationships hard, hard, rarely have emotional connections. Reality is that in both rebound and FWB, there will never be a long-term satisfaction and there will always be room for hurt or pain to grow deeper than before. Both parties may develop feelings for each other, but may, may have to shut it off. Being alone allows you to heal, think, evaluate, redefine your standards and find yourself once again. It is best to heal, assess your previous relationship, document the lessons learned while dwelling, while not dwelling too much on the past. Yes, it may hurt, but sometimes you need to realize people come into our lives for a reason and a season. When their time is up, they leave, teaching you a lesson or two, which will also help you grow and rejuvenate you. Do not spend time listening to sad love songs, but take the time to enjoy you. While you still have the breath, yeah. <laughs> okay. embrace yourself, regain yes. your confidence. Yes. Come off with that too. Did I do that not thing? stop dating and do not do pity yeah, parties top. either. Leave the life top. to the fullest um, and spend time in places yeah. where you will meet, network if possible. Thank you so much to me. You're welcome. Give us one second and we'll start the video again. Okay, thank you, Kami. Um, it's weird, just a little weird having someone tell us stuff that's like useful. 
I mean, everyone's stuff is everyone's stuff is wow, mission. Well, no, 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 no. This is why we have her nickname No No. Everyone can't call her that. I can. All three, four of the other ladies, we can because we know her so well. But what we're seeing is it's very interesting how you said that you have to get over, you have to let go of your bitterness, uh, and how you have the life, how you have the nuggets because chapters are very long and maybe people won't remember it. So how did you come up with that idea? Again, things come to me. Um, my writing is so different. Uh, I've, had, I've had people who review my books say my writing is different. And I look at reading books, I'm a reader. So I read a lot. And what I find is you read and you forget the things that you read. So to me, it's like, let me give nuggets that people will always remember. If you're reading my books and you go away and you hear something, it's going to draw you back. Something happens to you in life, um, relationship-wise. You're going to remember one of those nuggets or something from a nugget, and you're going to wake yourself up and say, hey, I just read that. So why do I need to repeat this? I cannot afford to repeat this. I have to stop myself at this moment because I write something that I need to hold on to. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I know that's um, it's definitely something I need to actually do because I continue to make the same mistakes and I continue to hope they have a different outcome. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to need the nuggets to, to hold on to like a bulletin point, almost like your vision board. You can put them on your vision board almost. Mm -hmm. so, Actually, I, I encourage people who read my book to take out from the nuggets, um, put it on sticky notes, put it in the bathroom mirror because that's a place you go all the time. Uh, put it on your refrigerator. So every time you walk around your house, some of the nugget points that you're taking out and placing on sticky notes remind you before you even step out the door on a date or, you know, to, to uh, meet up with your partner you have something you're taking away and you're going with yourself and remembering hey i just read this thing and when you read what, what happens when you read nugget points is it stays in memory so you're reading something from your refrigerator you're going out the door that thing is in your memory because it's still fresh and so when you get to where you're going and you hear a word that is contradictory to what you just read when you before you exited the house you're going to be like you know, aware of where you are with yourself and kind of hold yourself from, from repeating patterns, like I said. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah, exactly. Does anyone have any questions from the virtual audience and or the, the real audience? audience. We, we have like a hype going. It's really cool. It's beautiful. I'm loving it. What is Kimmy working on now? Kimmy, could you hear her? No, I can't hear her. What did she say? She said, what are you working on now? I'm working on my memoir, and my memoir consists of a lot. Um, my third book, Beyond the Pain, just came out. My memoir consists of things that we've experienced as a child and um, workplace experiences that also teach us about ourselves, as well as friends we meet and um, the way God speaks to me through nature. And, <laughs> and um I'm also, I, I also write affirmations, I'm mainly for the moment, and I'm, I'm coaching singles, just to make sure that, you know, we kind of build on healthier relationships, because from previous generation to our generation to the next generation, there are cycles that are being repeated, and it's better to just kind of break the cycle, break the chain, and help build healthier relationships, and, and not really carry the hurt and pain be, you know, along because when you're hurting and, and you carry the pain without healing, you can never truly love anyone from a place of pain. That's so true. That's so very and true. And I think a lot of times people go out and they try to start loving someone from a place of pain and then they try to like immediately cover it over like, oh, I can go get a new relationship. That's my band-aid. No. No, you need time for everything to heal and everything. You can't like run out and if you got cut for real and think you can stick a band-aid on it and keep moving. Without you're gonna, the stitches. You're gonna need stitches, proper medical care. So we need to do the same thing for ourselves emotionally as well. And I love that you brought that out in your book. And I'm loving the fact that your memoir is uh, about getting beyond the pain. And thank you, Ms. Jackie DC, for the wonderful question. Any more questions from the audience? More questions for the audience means less work for us. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess on this snowy day or wherever you are or where, where some people are in, in London on this late day, thank you for joining us still. It would so, be... So I was wondering, so Lola, would you mind saying hey real quick? Because we just love hearing from you. Yes, we did. No. No, <laughs> saying hi. Sorry. No, sorry. My... Um... What's it called? My mic was on mute. Um, can you hear me? Yes! Hi, everyone. Hi! I just love your accent on top yes. of it. I never said that one before. So, so yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's say it. That's actually my second home. Oh, really? Oh, London, yeah. Oh, cool. Whereabouts in London, do you say? Uh, not London. Ah, right. There is this battle between the North and the South. The North Londoners don't like South London. The South Londoners don't like North London. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure listening to all of you. Um, the little human. See, I always talk about my little human. She's sleeping now. So that's why I've been able to sneak in and sort of listen. But then so I've had to put everything on mute. And I see someone else is in her bedroom because I'm in the bedroom as well. <laughs> Okay, now you have me turning around to look like, what's going on back there? <laughs> is, that, is that Lindsay? Lindsay? She, she's in her bedroom as well. I'm in my bedroom. So. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, I just wanted to say it. I want to shout out your wonderful podcast that you have, the Sagola Salami Show, which is very awesome. A number one rated literary on iTunes. I mean, you have a very great podcast. And thank you for joining us today. Yes. Thank you very have, much for inviting me. She wasn't even on the panel, but we're going to shout this out to you. She has the executive producer, producer of, uh, author reality show coming up on January the 27th. She will actually tell you, stay in contact with her for the actual podcast date when it will play. I think it's sometime in February. Am I correct, Sagola? Sorry, you've lost me now. <laughs> Never mind. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, said I again. We weren't even supposed to be talking. It was just like, oh, she's there. I gotta say hi. Yes, yeah, but well, sorry, repeat what you said because I didn't get it at all. Oh, she wanted everyone to know where they can find your wonderful podcast and your website. Oh, right. Okay, but you said something about something in February, and I didn't get there. <laughs> Sam, look at her. Sam's <laughs> trying to clean it all up. Clean it up for her. <laughs> I was saying that in the future, you're going to have a show with the executive producer of 40 Day Author, the reality TV show. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. You know, I've got baby brain. I keep saying that, so please forgive me. Yes, we've got, we've got the author for today. So it's this lady. She's trying to, or she's in the process of setting up this for today reality TV program. Um, and it's kind of like Shark Tank. Uh, no, not like The Bachelor. So it's like you're going to have, 40 authors um, they're competing to get like a publishing deal and they'll be going against each other and doing lots of wonderful things. Um, so she's going to come talk about it on the show. Um, so that's going to that's gonna air sometime in February, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's just such a, it's such a cool thing, a cool, cool notion for, us, for the 40 day, the lady who came up with it. And then number two, that you got her as a, on the show. I want everyone to know. As you can yes, tell, yes. obviously. I yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much. You guys are super. And you know what? Everyone, I think you guys should say thank you to the end. I thought, ladies, because they love coming to my cafe, my podcast. They, they make it go around and around. And everyone thinks they're absolutely amazing. And they're so funny as well. <laughs> I'm seriously embarrassed now. Yes, if I'm, I were Caucasian, I'd be blushing. I'm, well, I, think, like, I should take your line that you took from Will I Am. I didn't like, like, yeah. But if I was lying, you would see my blush. <laughs> okay. We should probably move on. Move on. We promise. I know. I was like, I've been practicing all day. I got up this morning and I was like, professional Winona is showing up. Professional Winona I don't think I'm ever going to see the day. It's I don't think I'm ever going to see that day. Okay, okay now, can I just say lot. something there, right, Winona? I always admire your necklaces. Like, you always have, like... I think pearls, they have these um, really classy, you know, like, I don't know how to describe it, but every time I see you in pearls or similar necklaces, I always think, oh, you're so classy, right? Because that's what I think of people who wear pearls and saying, you're looking really smart. Don't worry that you just say things that make people laugh all the time, but you always have this really um, classy look Sokola, to you. You're setting me up, Sokola. You always <laughs> know she is like the narcissist. Now you're setting me up, Sokola. 
So I love you anyway. I was gonna say my smile can't get any bigger and my head can't get any bigger. So no, <laughs> I'm trying. Thank you so much for Thank you. I, I have like, an entire collection. And I've been spending, I spent most of my life collecting my pearls. I just love pearls. All ten years. You know, basically, that's kind of like me indirectly saying you can wear next year coming to London if you just bring some with you. <laughs> you know we're coming back in the spring for the TV show, right? Even better. So, how many can you, can I get one for each day of the week? No, no, no you can get two. <laughs> <laughs> one for you and one for the little human when she grows up. Okay, we'll do, we'll deal with that. We'll manage that. Thank you very much. Two, two is not too bad. Yeah, that's all. Okay, like you're welcome. Okay, okay, we're going back to Camille real quick. Camille, did you give us all of your credentials and everything? And where people can find you? And where they can find you? Um, they can find me on my, I was listening to her and I got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> You can find me on my website. It's www.kemionline.com. That's K-E-M-I online, all one word. Uh, my books are also on my website store, as well as Amazon, Kindle, Nook, iBooks, um, Create Space, um, Barnes & Noble, uh, everywhere, basically, Smashwords and Kobo. And you can also find me on Facebook. It's at Love Sex Lies. I'm reality on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram as my first and last name, Kemi Shigwe. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And so I hope you do stick around, though. Like yes, to, to I will. I'm reading. here. Good. And more importantly, you know, my reading in a minute. But anyway, yes, we're, we're going to have Kamichi come up and introduce herself. And then we're going to show um, a bit of her monologue, and then we're going to hear her reading. So I'm not going to lie, after she introduces herself, we're going to have a bit of technical trouble. And then <laughs> we're going to hear her read, okay? So we'll be right back. Kamichi, go ahead, introduce yourself. And I'm going to pop up for a second. Okay. <laughs> okay, so yes, okay. So could you go ahead and introduce yourself and we just section of your book and tell us where you're from. So my name is Kamiji Jackson and I'm the author of the new young adult novel, Okay, My Name is Kendra. Where am I looking at this black thing right now? Yep, the black thing. Okay. <laughs> Make sure I'm a little more And so today, I'm going to, right now the book is available. Yes, it's <laughs> right now the book is available on amazon.com create space and it'll be in other places there's going to be a website coming i i'm trying to get people to really come to goodreads so i would love for you all to connect with me on goodreads as kamichi jackson so the book has just recently come out um just to set up the reading a little bit this is a scene the book is about this 15 year old character kendra what happens when her sister returns? Her sister has been missing for several years. And uh, then what happens when she returns and what happens when an uncle comes back into the family? So there's some family drama that's going around that. So to set you up for the reading, what's taking place in this particular reading is that she and her, fam her sister are together and spending one of their first afternoons together. And remember, there's 10 years that have gone by, a lot of things they have not talked about and so it's basically a catch-up session so <clears throat> Kendra has told her mother that she's going to the library but she's lied about that she's spending time with her sister because no one else in the family knows that the sister is there yet so they're sitting in the car and she says I start talking about how me and Eris their older brother don't get along at all these days that somewhere deep down inside I'm sure I love him and he loves me but that he and I don't seem to have much to say to each other that it used to bother me a lot, but I think it's probably for the best now because he gets on my nerves and I don't have many good words for him anyway. I tell her about Philip, that's their younger brother, how he had decided in his senior year that he was going to skip college and try to get into the music industry as a rapper and a producer, but had bumped into some famous hip hop executive at an all-star party in Atlanta about a year ago and had come back from that trip with a new plan to go to business school while hustling his music so that he can someday launch his own record label and have a bigger piece of the game. 
Miyasha is extremely interested to hear about Jada, that's their younger sister, who was still in diapers when she left. When I tell her about Jada's talent for fashion, Miyasha gets all excited, since that is something she and Jada have in common. I'm sure once Jada meets Miyasha again, they'll click right away. For a minute, I'm kind of jealous at the thought, but then I push it to the side because I know for a fact that no matter how close my big sister and my little sister may get, nothing and no one can touch the special relationship that Miyasha and I already have, period. I don't have a whole lot to say about my parents when my sister asks me about them. I tell her daddy's still working at the same company that brought us to Virginia, except now he's a manager or something. She shakes her head when I mention that mama is working two jobs. She says she worries that mama's going to, bur to burn herself out one day soon. I don't respond because I don't want to have to say that I think mama started doing that to keep from thinking about Miaisha when she ran away from home. Miaisha gets kind of quiet when I tell her I don't have much news to report about some of the aunts, uncles, and cousins that she used to be close to because we don't really ever see or hear from them anymore. That after she left, things kind of just fell apart for reasons I know nothing about. She looks kind of sad when I say it, so I try really hard to think of something, anything I can tell her that might cheer her up. Our cousin Lakeisha pops into my head, so I talk about her and how she just started college last year. Now that might not be such a big deal if it weren't for the fact that she was someone the doctor said would never live past the age of five. Keisha's mother, one of daddy's favorite cousins, was diagnosed as HIV positive just before she got pregnant with Keisha. So Keisha was born with the disease. The doctor said she didn't stand a chance. And yet here she is, still alive at 19 and pursuing a career as a lawyer. No one knows if she'll ever get there, but she's here right now, and that's what we celebrate. That puts a smile on Miyasha's face. But then she asked about another one of our favorite cousins, Niles, and I feel bad that I have to be the one to deliver the news that he was killed in a drive-by four years ago. To this day, no one really knows what happened. As far as anyone can tell, he was just in the wrong place at the very wrong time. I tell her about the funeral and how horrible it was to see Niles laying there in that casket like that, how his mother, who we call Aunt Butter, threw herself in there with him and tried to, and had to be pulled out by four pallbearers where she, before she finally calmed down long enough for the minister to finish preaching. To this day, she ain't been right. Miyashi gets quiet again, and then she finally asks about Uncle CJ, which I figured she would get around to doing sooner or later. Has he been by lately, she asks, as she digs around in her purse. I get the feeling she doesn't really need anything in there, that she really just wants to hear about him but she's playing it off like it's a casual question. I remember Daddy telling me once that Uncle CJ had come as a complete surprise to Nan and Papa, who had married young, had kids young, and had already raised three by the time the doctor told them they were pregnant again with a fourth child. Daddy had only been married a few months himself when my grandparents called to say he was going to have a little brother. He and Mama helped take care of Uncle CJ as if he was their own because it had been years since Nan and Papa had a small child in the house, and it was flat out exhausting, they said. My uncle was still around a lot when Eris and Miaisha were born within the next few years, so growing up, he was more like a big brother to them than an uncle. They were tight, the three of them, even after he went off to college. On breaks from school, he would spend part of his time with his parents in Virginia in the house we live in now, and part of the time with us in Connecticut, where we lived back then. I was really young at the time, so I never really got to know him. But I've seen lots of pictures of the three of them together doing crazy stuff. And of him and Eris playing basketball and football with some of the boys from our old neighborhood. And of him and Miaisha laughing. That I do remember. Them laughing together all the time like they shared some private joke no one else ever got. I remember that she would pronounce his name Siege and he would call her baby girl. By that time, he was beginning to make headlines for his football skills, and some of my relatives said he started to change, started getting a little cocky, a little arrogant, Mama once told me. He lived with us for a minute the summer before his first season as a professional player. That was the last time I remember him being close with our family, though I know my brothers have kept in touch with him over years. After that summer, no one spoke about him anymore. After that summer, 
the two sides of the family stopped hanging out together. I could never understand why, but it hits me now that whatever had happened to change the family had happened that summer before me, I should left. Can I keep going or is it just too much? Okay. So, okay, so yeah. But thank you so much for reading and what inspired you to write this book? Um, it's a story that a lot of people have to deal with because um, it does it touch on topics like social topics like depression, especially in the black community. And there is some sexual abuse issues going on there. So that's not what the entire story is about, but those are topics that are touched on. And you hear about it so much. It was a story that I wanted to really write because I, I like the character. She reminds me of a few people I know. It's very awesome. Any questions from the audience? Oh, Winona. Well, I'm just sitting in the audience. Well, I'm so, um, have you done any recognition for your writing? So, for this book, yeah, I had entered the manuscript in the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award competition back in 2011, and there were tens of thousands of entries, and I kept making the cut up to the top 50, and then after that, my book journey was over. But um, so. On the front of the cover, I made sure that they knew it was a semi-finalist title. I felt I wanted to put there because it had gone through the process, and I hadn't entered a competition in years. So for, to get that far, I felt very honored. Yes. 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 <laughs> when it's fun, right? What did you say that already? Well, yeah, I think I did say that it was just the stories that I hear from other people, and. It seemed like such a, a story that so many people are suffering from some of the issues that go on here. It just, I felt like there was something that had to be said, something that had to be told. And so I created characters to tell those stories that I'm hearing from other people. And is that your debut? This is actually my second book. This is my second. The first one was a chapter, kind of a chapter book for young readers, which I am gonna re-release because I really love that book and that character. Uh, it's a nine-year-old character named Reggie Brown. Um, so the, that book is called You're Too Much, Reggie Brown. I'm going to re-release that one. But this is my attempt at a, a young adult novel. And then from here, I want to go on to, I promise, Seji, was it Lola, that I would do a second book to this. She made me promise. And then I'm going to do an adult novel it's called The Brownstone. So I think I'll hit every genre I can. Hmm? Yes. Is the second book after this going to be based on Kendra or someone else? It'll be Kendra. It's going to be called, uh, that much I do know, starring me as myself. And it's going to be Kendra probably a couple years further along, having dealt with some of the issues, but there's got to be new challenges, and I haven't figured that out yet. But it will star Kendra in some way, maybe even different, with a different cast of characters. I'm not even sure of that. Have you always had the gift of writing? When I was in school, uh, I did a lot of, not creative writing, but book reports, and I knew I liked to write them. I didn't discover that I could write until I was 21, 22 years old, and that's when I put the first book out. I had no idea that I had enough stories in me and that I could craft stories. I just didn't know. She meant like that was two years ago. So. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Many, many years ago. No, 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 no. Was, I was gonna touch that. It was two years ago, you guys. Twenty three now. Promising career. Awesome. Awesome. And so now I'm gonna invite Winona back up because we are going to read from one of our novels. Uh yeah, after Winona goes to get it. <laughs> she she forgot it. That's that's funny. But that's that's my life. That's about right. It, it's about that's, that's about right, yeah. So Winona's gonna come and take my chair. Oh. And here we go. Hello, y'all. I'm back in front of the camera, my favorite place to be. <laughs> oh, you can stand there. Yeah, However okay. you want to move, that doesn't really matter to me. Okay. It's nice. I get to share it with someone who's like, okay. like semi-finalist award winning. Oh, Take a picture. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> So I am going to read from our book quickly, and then we're going to, I think we're going to have the New York lady read in a minute. So um, I'm going to actually read her. <laughs> I'm going to actually read hers, which is funny. It's a great introduction to her, huh? 
So it's in lesson six of our book, and our book is called, And I Thought I Did My Journey Alone. Just in case y'all didn't know, we've got four of them. You can check us out on Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, or at AndWeThought.com, our actual website, where you can see everything we did. All right, it's called In the Winter Is by Tara Turner. You can't have me. I'm here, and you're there. And you don't know how to get me. You can't know what I know, and you can't feel what I feel. And you can't do it like I do. It has nothing to do with my smile, my style, oh, my swagger. I give myself permission to admit I'm better than you. It has nothing to do with your pride, your plans, or your desires. So no neck rolls, mm -mm. no finger snaps, and no ultimate. Just a lovely note on my best stationery, spritch with my jumpa You're worth that much at least. And I forgive myself for cheating myself because of you. And you loved me that much harder because you knew it too. <clears throat> Praying I wouldn't open my eyes. So this is me leaving sometimes wearied, strained to the breaking point with all of your trying. It's no small thing that I'm standing here today straight, whole, and pure. My heart beating wildly once I've acknowledged this, no one more surprised than me. You can't have me. And I've realized, finally, I'll be so much more than just five. And for the one that, for the lady that could not make it here today, and uh, we kind of gathered in honor of almost kind of sort of scarlet black. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and give her poem a try, the old college try, by Scarlet Black and Alexis Rose. Book studying and getting down to business, putting on a little chubby me. Classes, friends, choosing to study, learning how to define me. Frat, sorority, and the occasional party, experiencing college freely. Boyfriends, girlfriends, learning boys from men, and then... I met you with that wavy hair and great eyes. Now my friends say you can't love him. A compliment shouldn't make you cry. I have no answers, but I know I'll give this the old college try. To you, I studied to become unsmart, but this is a matter of the heart. To my friends, you don't understand. It's not me. It's, it's not the man. Ah, sorry. Let me go back. To my friends, you don't understand. It's me, not the man. If I correct what's wrong, he'll see clearly. Then he can love the improved me. I'm trying to explain what makes good sense. Y'all's opinion is making this relationship tense. Stop acting like you don't see the flaws. I am tired of your pretense. I know how to improve. The ball is in my court. It's my move. Study harder. You'll see I'm not stupid. Stop looking at other men. He's the best offering from Cupid. Have fake hair just a little longer. I can't forget the eyelashes. Have a rounder booty that look like acorn squashes. I need to plump my lips and fill out my hips. For my eyebrows, I buy black or dye. He doesn't control me. I'm giving it the old college try. My grades are slipping and I don't know why. I sit alone at night waiting to cry. I know you don't hit me, but somehow I feel you lie. I toy with the idea of trying to die. I'm existing on this earth for what? For why? I'm not good enough for a reward in the sky. You aren't abusive, that I'll animately deny, but when you speak, your words sting like lie. At my dorm and wait, you lie. You tell me I'm so pretty and then unpretty, but note the females as they pass by. I failed again, I say with an inner sigh. I promise you, I'm giving it a better old college try. I drink only water, I lose the weight, but just by a quarter. I don't eat, but you insist on my diet. I cheat, I don't see fat, but you'll point it out like that. I make sure to do extra study, but I never learn, supposedly. I ask you, what else could be wrong with me? My college try is old, so meager for me. You don't seem to notice the true me. Now you have your master's degree and a wife that wants more as she cheats still the lives. My suggestion to you, give her the old 
college try. And that was my end of my reading today. Any questions for us? Oh, wait. Excuse me. <laughs> 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 and I thought he was the one. And well, we are done. Pretty we're much. almost done, and so we have a couple of other things to to hurry up and get done. So we're hoping for um, late winter, early spring. Yes, it was supposed to be this month, and then <clears throat> that because like I actually had to turn in my books, um, and then I I started playing around with the uh, TV pilot episode thing, which I hear is not that great. <laughs> I'm joking. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm turning that one into a book too. So I'll have the end. I thought maybe it's the episode novels as well. So we, yeah, so that, um, and I think That's was the I'm one joking. should probably be out in March or April of this year. Okay, you guys, so we're having such a climate weather here that we're going to have to like wrap up very soon. I know Tara is here. And so if you would, do your reading for us, Tara. Um, Tara if we could keep it into like five yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, the last. Five minutes. Yeah. Can you give us a five minute reading, Tara? <laughs> so, um, they just announced that the library that we're having it at right now is going to close at three, so we have to push it. I'm really sorry. And then you guys can do like what, five minutes of our London interview? No, we don't have time. I love you very much. No, <laughs> I love you very much, Tara. Tara. Tara, hello? Tara? She's there, right? I thought she was. She's not here? All right, okay. so we'll do the five minutes of our interview and- No, we're good. Okay, well guys, thank you so much for joining us and hopefully we'll do this virtual um, book reading part two. We'll call it part two and Tara will be there and hopefully everyone else will join us back. And thank you for all the authors that came out. Jenny, what up? Thank you. All right. <laughs> Just real quick, sorry. Just <laughs> thank you for all the authors that came out. And thank you, Kimmy, for showing up and reading your book. All right, you guys, have a great day. And thank you again for joining us. We will be sending out emails. We'll do it part two, OK? OK, so this is the end, I thought, ladies, and our wonderful authors today saying wisdom is all around you if you're open to finding it and accepting it. Peace and love, you guys. Bye. 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 So they say go, huh? Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden it got bad as yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah. yeah.